morning. Welcome to the uh, annual Frederick Buechner Lectures at the King Institute for Faith and Culture here at King University. It's a delight to have you with us this morning, whether you're here in person or online. My name is Martin Dodderwijk, and I direct the King Institute for Faith and Culture. And this is always a highlight of our year as we honor the American author Frederick Buechner. Buechner died last summer at 96, having produced a tremendous body of written work that embodies a dynamic intersection of Christian faith and culture. He wrote novels, he wrote memoirs, he wrote sermons, and was a genial and gracious presence for many, many years for many people. Buechner came to our campus twice in, this, uh, in these auspices, and it was a delight to host him in those years. Remembering his work, we try to bring in people who embody that same spirit, that ability to bring wonder and curiosity shaped through the lenses of faith as we approach as Christians the culture around us. We have brought a number of people in the past who have represented different ways of approaching that, and I am delighted this year to welcome Matt Milliner. Before I introduce Matt, I want to tell you we have a number of events today. This is a full day. Um, he's earning his money today uh, as we do, we do a lot of work. Um, after this morning lecture, if you want to spend some time chatting, we're going to go to the Tadlock House. We're going to have coffee there and some light refreshments. You're very welcome to join us to spend some time with Matt there. Um, a little after, about 11.20, 11.30, we're going to head over to the cafeteria for lunch. This will be in the Tipton Room. Um, if you are a visitor to us, and, or if you're uh, somebody who's on faculty and staff, tell them you're with the King Institute and we'll get your lunch. They will wave you in, um, and then we'll meet and have lunch there uh, in the cafeteria. At 5 o'clock tonight in the First Presbyterian Church, we'll have an onstage conversation between me and Matt. Uh, that's at 5, and then at 6, there's a reception to follow. Uh, at 7 o'clock, he's going to give us his evening lecture. So I encourage you to be at any of these events you can, and uh, they're, they're all going to be special. They're all different, and I'm delighted that these are, are taking place today. Matt Milliner is, like me, a graduate of Wheaton College. He then went to Princeton Theological Seminary for an MDiv, and while he was doing the MDiv, he discovered increasingly a desire to study visual arts. So he went, as he says, across the street to Princeton University, started talking to the art history department, and then engaged in a PhD there. He then after, uh, went back to Wheaton, where he teaches art history. And along the way, he's written about just about everything. I have read articles uh, by Matt about zombies and the four cardinal virtues. I've read articles about uh, First Nations peoples. I've read all kinds of things. A wonderful review of the Biennale in Venice this past year. His writing ranges uh, dramatically. And in every case, it brings that Buechnerian sense of the ability to look through the lenses of faith at the world of culture and have each informed by the other. That shows up particularly in his two published books, which we will have later on for sale. Uh, the one that he'll speak on tonight is called Mother of the Lamb. This is a history of a global icon, uh, which was a lot of his PhD research. And the second one, which he's going to be uh, riffing off this morning, but expanding on this morning, is called The Everlasting People, G.K. Chesterton and the First Nations. I commend these both. They're thoughtful, interesting, unexpected, and fabulously researched books. Even the footnotes are good in these books, which I don't always say, but Matt's footnotes are a delight to read. Um, he's also a delight in person. I'm so happy he's here. Thank you for being here. Please join me in welcoming Matt. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for being here, everybody. This is working wonderful. Um, of all the charms of Bristol, one of the first was realizing, so who is this royal personage that King's University is mentioned after? Um, it, was it George III? And then you realize, no, it's a guy named King. It's so wonderfully American, a guy named King. And so th th I, uh, coming to realize the beauty of, of private entrepreneurship and patronage is one of the signals of American universities. So I'm delighted to be here and also on a more serious note, looking at these hills and thinking of that wonderful line in Genesis, the desire of the everlasting hills. What do these hills want? What do these mountains, these ancient mountains, which of course used to be as high as the Himalayas, that have been eroded down, what are they looking for? They're looking for Christ. That's what they want. It's what we all want. 
And having spent a lot of time in these mountains myself, um, whether it's a summer camp job or, or coming here for different tourings, occasions here and there, youth group retreats, um, no one ever told me what I'm about to tell to you. Um, you may know it. If you do, this will be a wonderful refresher. If you don't know it, um, you will be stunned, not by my uh, oral performance, but by the, the power of the narrative, of the story um, that you're about to hear. So I hope you find this interesting. I like that I can move around. Um, sometimes in class, I like to sit in the back and click, right? Uh, so see how things are going. But we've got some things to, to talk about. Um, if this was an art history lecture, which I'm an art historian, so um, I would, I would uh, talk about these paintings that you see and sculptures and pieces of architecture on the left. And we're going to connect that to the history of this area. To summarize what I want to say, I thought of it this way. You know, I used to glamorize the early Christian era and the Renaissance era. And when I learned what I'm about to tell you, I realized I don't have to glamorize the times of origin and, and the great martyrs of Rome. I don't have to think about uh, Botticelli and the great Renaissance artists. I live in that time, and so do you. You live in a time as interesting as the early Christian era, as interesting as the Renaissance. That's the claim that I want to make. I'm going to try to prove it to you. We'll see if, if you concur. And um, I'm not going to use any of these terms, woke or anti-woke. Racism or anti-racism, decolonization or white supremacy, and nor am I going to criticize those who do use them. So I hope you have your attention now in the sense of, whoa, whoa, these are some hot button issues. They are, but I believe that what I want to share with you in some senses transcends hot button issues. Whatever you think about those terms, whether you're on board with some of them or against some of them, what I'm saying is in some senses, deeper than headlines or bullet points. It is a fundamental fact of the history of this land. Whatever you think about this, what I'm saying to you is going to matter. And, I'm, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree. My goal is to make you thrilled to be here, here, in Bristol, and make me sad to leave. Make me watch, oh gosh, I wish I could stay here longer and explore the things that, that I'm going to unfurl for you. Save you money on airfare, too. You don't have to go to Europe. <laughs> because the, the glory of the early Christian era that you would pursue in Rome, or in Florence, the Renaissance era, it's all right here. That's, that's my goal. So again, if this was an art history class, I would walk you through the ancient art of Paleolithic Old Stone Age Europe all the way into the historic era with those ancient pyramids. I might say that's where the real history is when it comes to the three classifications of what we call art coined by the Renaissance. A great art historian named Giorgio Vasari said there's sculpture, painting, and architecture. That's what there is. Michelangelo does all three so beautifully, which is why he loved him so much. But you could take a figure like this, 6,000 B.C., early human sculpture, I like to think of it as proof that humans are made in the image of an image-making God. Proof that humans are made in the image of an image-making God. Because if we're made in the image of an image-making God, it stands to reason that we would make images too. Animals don't do this. We do. And so we have these figures, these elusive figures that emerged. As this one's from Jordan. Painting, easy, right? the great cave paintings in the Dordogne region of France. Cave of Forgotten Dreams, the Werner Herzog documentary of the Chauvet Caves. I hope you've seen it. It's astonishing. And you have an anthropologist, whether he's a Christian or not, I don't know, but he says, homo sapiens, no, homo spiritualis, yes. Humans are spiritual creatures. Where does he get that evidence? From this, from the cave paintings of Lasso in this case. They are proto-cinematographic. They are, they are more impressive than an IMAX because they wrap around you. Are they just hunting tallies? They're more than that. They're proof that humans are made in the image of an image-making God. Architecture, 
And that also is easy. We could go anywhere, but let's just go to the cave, or to, rather, the caves deep beneath the mastabas, which are attempt to preserve the body. The Greeks denigrated the resurrection of the body, but the Egyptians, oh, they were all over it. They said, I'm into that. They wouldn't have laughed at Paul when he preached in Athens about the resurrection of the body. Their ears would have perked up, tell me more, Paul. And we've been so in conversation with Greek thought as Christians, not enough with African thought, the Egyptians who believed in the resurrection, maybe we would be more ensconced and connected to our idea of the resurrection if we had been more in touch with Egyptian society. You take one mastaba, which is intended to protect that body that is kept down there from the coyotes, from those who would devour the flesh, and you add one mastaba on top of the other, you got yourselves a pyramid. What are they? Testimonies to the belief in the resurrection of the body. Maybe it's just for the Pharaoh. We Christians democratize the idea of the resurrection. It's for everybody. Rich, poor, everybody. Starting with Jesus. And yet they at least believed in it for some. And so we put that together, and that's European art. And we love it. And we Americans have always been in the shadow of it and said we have to go get educated in Europe. Do you feel that longing to do the study abroad semester? That's where the action's at. It's been in America for many generations. Here's Giorgio Vasari, that art historian I mentioned, and what he shows you in the Renaissance. He says, isn't it amazing? Painting, sculpture, and architecture in my time in the 1500s in Florence are rising from the dead. The Greco-Roman tradition is coming to life in my own time. He loved it to live in Florence in the 1500s. And that's why we want to go to those cities. But it's also the fact that all of that tradition has been Christianized. And so that man becomes Michelangelo's David after going through the purgings of Jewish iconoclasm, the breaking of images, the purification of images. Lasso becomes Raphael Stanza della Segnatura. The great mural tradition is Christianized, thank God. And the pyramids, of course, are purged and become the holy temple of the Israelites that then becomes echoed in Christian churches. So that's the story. That's why we love Europe. And it's all here, all of it. The same principles. This county, do you know that there's an active archaeological dig here in this county in Tennessee? Dating to the Middle Woodland period, that is 300 to 700 AD with artifacts being found. Have you visited it, right? Probably not too many of you have. There's a sense of um, just not realizing that there is a long history of human habitation here. And the very same things that Giorgio Vasari said in his time, oh my gosh, we're discovering this culture from under the ground here in Florence, the ancient Romans. That's happening in this county. <laughs> and not many people know about it. And yet you live here. And so this is a present reality underneath your feet that is rising up. Sculpture, painting, and architecture, all of it is here. Take a drive. This is a good drive, I admit but it's within your state, about six hours away, to the Wycliffe Mound State Historic Site. And what do you find there? You find these gorgeous marine shells, which gives you a sense of how expansive the society that I'm speaking about was, how they were everywhere, so they could pick up, sometimes you'll see great shark teeth, great white shark teeth in some of these mounds or obsidian from the Rocky Mountains. That's how expansive their trading networks were. And when you carve those shells, it turned into pendants like this. And look at that. So this, we might say, is the sculpture that was found in the Wycliffe Mounds here in Tennessee. And what do these birds and wind patterns mean? That's what we're going to talk about. Painting, is it here? Take a drive about two and a half hours away to the Judicala Rock. What is the Judicala Rock? You can walk around it. You can get a different view of it. Thank goodness it is preserved. And some think it might be a map of the land with these an early understanding of a bird's eye view of this terrain, this territory. That's what some theorists say about this rock. 
between 500 and 1700 A.D., these carvings were made. There's an image of it. We know that this is one fraction of what would have been in the painted rocks of this region. And the fact that it survives is a precious reality. And what about architecture? No different, folks. No different than the pyramids. Take a drive two and a half hours away. Of course, there would have been some more immediately available, but sometimes farmers come in and remove the beautiful burial mounds that were here. Maybe you know of ones that are closer than this one, but I simply point you to the Nikwasi Mound. Signs of a Cherokee town in this area. Look at that. I mean, does that not give a new uh, sense of resonance to your typical strip mall in America? Right? That this one at least preserved this mound that was there and said, don't touch that. That might be holy. That might be important. That's a Christian sensibility. Bodies matter. Don't just rip tombs down. The resurrection is for all. Maybe somebody said that. Maybe that's why that's still there. 1,000 years ago, how many people think about this land with that in mind? Again, saving the money on the trip to Europe. So the same things are here, and the claim that I want to make is that like the art of Europe has been Christianized, the art of the ancient Native American cultures here has been Christianized as well. How would I make that claim? That's the question. We'll see if I can convince you of it. There's not a lot of literature about this. I wish there was more. Maybe one of you will write it. <laughs> and you have a lot of assistance in this regard. These books that I'm throwing up here, and this, this uh, talk is on YouTube, so you, just, you can scan to this part and, and look up this bibliography if you want to pursue some of these books. These are all people writing about just how Christianity was pervasive in indigenous American societies, both in the missionary era and today. So you pick your tribe, and I can guarantee you, you can find a book like this, or at least an article, about how Christian missionaries interacted, sometimes patronizingly, with those indigenous societies, and how they welcomed Christianity, and this is important, on their own terms. On their own terms. Pentecost, many tongues, tribes, and nations. The infinite translatability of Christianity, according to the missiologist Andrew Walls, it happened here. But we forgot it. We neglected it. And it's rising up from under our feet again. And when it comes to the Cherokee, who were, of course, in this area, this is the book I would recommend. You can pick it up, not very expensive on Amazon, The Cherokees and Christianity. It's what I am drawing from so that everything you know that I say, you can find. You can find the notes. You can see the stories. You can read them for yourself. So I'm picking from this wonderful array of material, and I'm saying, learn more about this. It will excite you to live here if you're not excited about it already. Now, how did Christianity come? It's a fun story and a sad one. But we're going to have both the fun and the sadness as we tell it. So the Moravians. Now, these Moravians were amazing. They were, um, in some senses, more evangelical than evangelicals today. The Asbury Revival, have you heard of it? Has anyone been to it? Okay, they would have been there. The Moravians would have, oh, the Spirit's moving, let's go. <laughs> they were, they were uh, revivalists in the sense of an emotive piety. These Moravians were wonderful. They sparked John Wesley's work. They did so much of this, and they were very successful with the Lenai Lenape Indians, where I'm from in New Jersey. Other missionaries failed. The Moravians succeeded. But I'm sorry to tell you that amongst the Cherokee in this land, the Moravians, they fell flat on their face. 1799, they came here. Three years, they tried to work with the, those who inherited the paleo-old Indian culture, the paleo-Indian culture that came before, who were Cherokee in this land. No dice. Why? They wanted them to become European. So the Cherokee were like, no thanks, we don't like your message. Off you go. The Presbyterians. Any, we, we got any Presbyterians in the room? Okay, sorry to say, there, this wasn't your brightest moment. 
Uh, I am a former PCUSA member and choir in the ordination process. I have much to be thankful for, Presbyterian Seminary, but you just got to tell the story like it is. They, it didn't work. So there was this man, Gideon Blackburn, and he had initial success. He said, well, I'll get him to be European. I'll get them to. Now, this wasn't just patronizing. It was if you're going to make it in American society, you got to learn the way of our culture. And so some of the indigenous people would say, okay, I'll learn, I'll learn. So that could be successful. But nevertheless, he gave them some ability to have Western dress, to operate in my ancestors' ways. And that worked for a while, but he also took advantage of the situation. And he said, um, because I'm working with the Native Americans, I have connection to land, and I'd like a big tract of land for myself, said Blackburn. And the American government said, sure, we'll give that to you. And he said, thank you. And all of a sudden, the Cherokee, are you here for us or for you? And then he started, I kid you not, to peddle whiskey through the Cherokee res place where he was. And so what happens was he has these big ships coming through. So he has all this land. And all of a sudden, there was one a man named Big Warrior, a chief of the Creek Nation, and he said, can I check what's in your boat, Reverend Blackburn? And he said, no. He said, I'd just like to know you're coming through my land here. And he looked, and there was this huge stash of whiskey that Blackburn was distilling on the land that the government had given him, all under the banner of missionary activity for the Cherokee. So the guy was totally busted, utterly disgraced, not the Presbyterian's highest moment. So Blackburn was a failure. The Presbyterians did not make it work. The Congregationalists came. Any Congregationalists out there? Maybe a couple here or there. They were also, unfortunately, patronizing. Not honoring the Cherokee on their own terms. But they did lobby on behalf of the Cherokee in Washington. And so that's very honorable. I don't want to... I want to honor the work that they did. I'm not just making fun of it. They did important work. But it is clear that they refused any Cherokee possibilities for their own culture to be manifested in Christianity. None at all. When I received the gospel in youth group as a high schooler, they didn't say, now you need to learn to speak Spanish because the gospel will only be presented in Spanish. No. They said, English works fine for us. Here's the good news of Jesus Christ. But imagine being told you need to speak another language first before you hear the good news of Jesus. They didn't give me a new outfit to wear. They said, your outfit's fine. Here's the good news of Jesus. Imagine being told you have to be European first. It was that way with the Congregationalists. You cannot pursue your own culture. It's true that among some Cherokee, they could not receive the possibility of Jesus and the possibility of forgiveness. And when I hear stories like this, of a certain Cherokee chief who said, brotherly love and forgiveness, that does not work with our culture. And I say, that's because your culture is not enough. No culture is enough. Jesus fulfills cultures. And as true as that is, that some Cherokee hesitated with the message of forgiveness, it's also true that the missionaries didn't perceive the moments of forgiveness that were already in Cherokee culture. Sensitive missionaries might have said, wow, you have a purification ceremony where debts are forgiven, sins are released. That's what the gospel is about. But the, but the in missionaries didn't see that. They didn't see that. And so we have the Moravians failed, the Presbyterians failed, the Congregationists failed, the Methodists, almost. The Methodists are great. They had these circuit riders who, of course, were in this area. And they started to say, you can't eject the Cherokee from this land. But the pressure was so severe. I like to think I would have been one of the persons that said, yes, I would have stood up for the Cherokee, but you know what would have happened? Then my relatives and my friends would have pressured me and I would have done what the circuit riders did. They relented. And they said, oh, okay, okay, okay. Get them out of here. They gave up in the face of white pressure. So, so where's our good news? Do we have Baptists in the room? No Baptists? We got one Baptist, at least one Baptist. The Baptists nailed it. They nailed it. Daniel, Sabin, Buttrick. He leads his flock to vote, his whole congregation, we're going to vote against the Cherokee removal policy. And that's not enough. Instead, he also says, 
I think their language might in some ways be superior to our own. And he gives us a book that is still available and valuable to researchers, The Antiquities of the Cherokee Indians. He studied and he was amazed at the way God was already present with them. And he wrote this book. And that's a lifetime of non-patronizing honor of that culture. General Winfield Scott supervised the Trail of Tears. And in his journal, he talks about, well, you know, I guess it was, it was better for them. Better for them that they got ejected. I think they've been improved by transportation. And I compare that to the journal of another Baptist named Evan Jones. What did Evan Jones say in his journal? You ready for this? He went with them on the Trail of Tears. That's Christianity. You're being ejected? So am I. I'm leaving with you. And this Baptist from Wales, they were exceedingly depressed, almost in the agonies of despair. I don't think Winfield Scott was on the ground hearing the cries of agony. Most of their faces, I fear, we shall not see again till the great day when the oppressor and the oppressed shall appear before the tribunal of the righteous judge. I have no language to express the emotions which rend our hearts to witness their season of cruel and unnecessary oppression. For if it be determined to take their land and reduce them to absolute poverty, do we have to kill them too? That's a Christian journal entry. I'm not saying Winfield Scott wasn't a Christian. He's a sinner redeemed by grace like me. But man, that's a heritage that I am proud of. The secret of our success is no secret. How did they do it? Native agency. Without which I think nothing extensive can be expected. We learned to listen. We learned to listen. And then Christianity took off. It ceased to be the white man's religion as God was redefined in terms closer to the great spirit. It became possible to define the pious Cherokee as the true children of God and not the treacherous and corrupt white people. Not that all the pe white people were tre treacherous and corrupt. What a story of this land. The Kitoa Society. They said, now let's honor the Cherokee heritage. Let's honor it and put it in conversation with Christianity. It happened in this land. So how was it Christianized? Let's try it with the three. Can we do it? I've never read anything that tries. Let's give it a try. Here's the Coxmound Gorget, thing found at the Wycliffe site. What is that figure? Some think it might be a kingfisher. Some think it might be a, a woodpecker. And so I'm thinking, all right, let me look at this as an art historian, knowing what I now know about the missionaries and their success and Cherokee Christianity. Yes, it's a violent culture, but have you ever looked into Anglo-Saxon culture? It's pretty violent too. And it also received the gospel. And so, look at that decapitated head on another gorget. And so I thought about this. I said, how would we look at this? And I know a story from Renaissance art. So look, see what Woodpecker has, the red head? Now some people connect that to the violence of warring tribes in the Paleo-Indian and Middle Woodland period. But here is a European goldfinch. And you notice the red splash as well. Well, there's a story in the Renaissance era going back to the Middle Ages. Here's Raphael's goldfinch Madonna and we zoom in and we see that very goldfinch with Jesus petting it and John the Baptist handing the goldfinch to Jesus what do you think's being said the legend is that when Jesus was dying the last drop of blood shed for our salvation came from his hands and a goldfinch that up until that point didn't have the red splash flew right under it hit the windshield, and the goldfinch had read there ever since. Does that check out biologically? It doesn't matter. It is speaking on a poetic and theological level. And so what if we could see that woodpecker as a um, the violence of a society, purified and fulfilled 
by the passion of Christ. Cherokee themselves believed that. Why can't we read back onto the mounds of this area in the same way? And yet, I did notice that some people say, please don't think that the woodpecker is violent. Some Cherokee themselves and different tribes in this area say, that's not the case. We don't think that's the way we, that should be interpreted. And if that's so, we can do something different. Now, I want you to notice, do you notice there's a cross in the center of this gorget? There's a cross. We can work with that, can we not? And what the anthropologists tell us is that in indigenous societies, they had an upper world and a lower world, and the cross symbolized the council fire with two logs crossed that was the fulcrum of the upper and lower worlds. Here's another map of the cosmos of the, of the middle woodland period, the Mississippian Indians. And so if that's the way they saw the world, look at this. One person says maybe these four woodpeckers represent the four winds or the four thunderers. Can we work with that as believers? You've read the book of Revelation. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth. I would suggest that that is rather compatible with the biblical understanding of the world. In fact, if you break this down, you have the four represents the earthly plane and the circle represents the heavenly plane. That's what the best anthropologists tell us about this Mississippian view of the world. And if you go to Hagia Sophia in what is now Istanbul, once was Constantinople, what do you have? The same thing. The terrestrial square going from Revelation and the celestial circle, I see a compatibility yet again. You can skip the trip to Istanbul and you can go to the Wycliffe Mounds instead. The same coherent cosmos fulfilled in Christ is in Tennessee. What about the painting? That's kind of easy. Because if this indeed is a map of this terrain, this sacred terrain that you have the honor of worshiping Christ upon, sometimes people think that maybe this is the handprint of a Cherokee giant, Judicola, who is saying these are the boundaries of this land. And I look at the book of Acts. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God said, these people belong here. And sometimes I wonder, did my ancestors violate Acts 17, 26, when we said, no, you don't belong here, actually? <laughs> Astonishing. So we can think of that, ponder the Judicola rock from a Christian point of view, and of course realize that the Cherokee syllabary was later created, and the Bible, of course, was the first book that the Cherokee syllabary, this new alphabet, was translated into. And I uh, appeal to my colleague, Melissa Harkrider, a historian who has done so much work, and she has shown me these beautiful Cherokee hymns and said, hear the gospel in this great language that was created by Sequoia. That's the fulfillment of the Judicola rock, in my opinion. And then what about the architecture? This is where it gets hard. And this is, this is where the difficulties lie for all of us. Your dead shall live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. The earth will give birth to the dead. A pregnant earth, that's a biblical concept. So every mound was a womb awaiting the general resurrection. But we can think of it more than just that. If it's true that the Cherokee received Christianity, and this is the most important thing I'll say this morning, if it's true, and it is, then if America was Christian, that would have been the end of it. You can stay, welcome, but we're not just Christian. There were more spirits than the Holy Spirit at work in this continent because the Christianity didn't do them much any good. And they were still ejected, as you well know, from this land. They were still treated mercilessly despite their Christian faith. This is a map, of course, of where they have been ejected to. And notice that we, in this area, I'm in Illinois, you're in Tennessee, are in 
relatively Indian-less areas because of the policies that, of course, were enacted. Here's Chief John Ross. If the president of the white people should cease to protect us in our right and rob us of our rights, then I say to you, bear like Job and you will be rewarded. There are descendants of Chief Ross in this room. And here's what he said as he begins to realize the extermination policy that he was up against. The land of the Cherokee, bit by bit, due to the treaties, is eroded. Amazingly enough, June Aluska saved Andrew Jackson's life on the $20 bill. A Cherokee. And yet, it was Jackson that forced him out. Don't spend a $20 bill on an Indian reservation. It will often be turned back to you. We don't want to see Jackson. We don't want to see him because of what he made happen, even though he was saved by a Cherokee. Jeremiah Everts of blessed memory, how did he die? He was lobbying Congress to stop this policy. Look at the book, From Revivals to Removal. And he overworked himself and died of tubercular tuberculosis. It reminds me of James Burr on our campus, who was imprisoned for trying to free property, steal property, that is, free slaves. And he was thrown into prison, contracted that disease, and died. And he wanted to be buried on abolitionist ground, which is what Wheaton is. And we had to uncover that from the earth. We had buried our abolitionist heritage, and we brought it up. So I think of Jeremiah Everts and the work that he did. Now, you want to go to Rome. Everyone wants to go to Rome. There are movies about traveling to Rome. Why do you go to Rome? Because all those ancient pagan areas, Circus Maximuses and Colosseums, what were they? They were sites of Christian martyrdom. Every dome in Rome, this is the contemporary scene in Rome that you see, is like a mushroom that testifies, oh, martyr, martyr died here, martyr died here, martyr died here. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. It's the fifth seal in the book of Revelation. Same thing. That's the trail of tears. This land is as holy as Rome. <laughs> because if martyrs make places holy, this applies. I don't see how it could be otherwise. We can mourn at that, but we still go to Rome to rejoice at the triumph of Christ. Can we say that in regard to the Cherokee nation as well? Not far from here in Chattanooga, you've probably been there, the launching point of the Trail of Tears with beautiful Cherokee designs. I visited it myself. It should be a Christian place of pilgrimage. This is where it began. And as they took the sacred fire of the Cherokee Nation along with them to Oklahoma, they took the faith with them as well. Not all of them, I understand that, but a great percentage. The Cherokee little people is a legend. They're called the Yunwi Tusundi, essentially fairies in the Cherokee tradition. And James Mooney, an American anthropologist, recorded in 1900 a legend that these, these little fairy crosses, and the story is that when the Yunwi Tusundi were told about Jesus, that God died, that their tears turned into these crosses. And you can see these at the Cherokee County Historical Museum. Now I know, you think that's just a fairy tale, right? And if you, you know, Google it, you'll see the weird Carolinas or strange Carolinas website that say, wow, that can't be true. Do you not know how myths work? <laughs> Do you not know how to read poetry? What do you mean it's not true? It is a fact that when the Cherokee were told about Jesus, their tears did turn into crosses on the Trail of Tears. We need to reclaim these stories and not look at them through a scientific lens, but through a poetic and a mythic lens. The fairies were real. The Cherokee and their acceptance of Christianity are real. Here's Godric of Finkel that Frederick Buechner writes about. A great medieval saint from a thousand years ago, just like your Nkwasi Mound is a thousand years ago. 
And Beekner says, a light breeze blew that tossed the trees, and I lay there watching the trees. They formed a face of shadows and of leaves. It was a man's green, leafy face. He gazed at me from high above. Beekner is referring to the green man tradition in medieval English lore, this elusive figure who would appear in the woods like fairy stories. Now, who is this figure? Beekner tells us. His was the holiest face I ever saw. My very name turned holy on his tongue. If he had bade me rise and follow me to the end of time, I would have gone. If he had bade me die for him, I would have died. When I deserved it least, God gave me most. I think it was the Savior's face I saw. The green man is Christianized for Godric of Finkel and for Beekner, and the same thing with the apparition of the spirits and fairies in the woods of this land as well. It too has been Christianized. I think it was the Savior's face I saw. The fulfillment of centuries, no, millennia of indigenous belief and ritual in the faith that was then immediately eradicated by my ancestors. That's a story. And it's not just a story. It's the true story of this land that you get to live on. Was it Christianized? I hope that case is clear. Do we need those words to fight about? Maybe. Maybe they're helpful. I'm not, again, attacking those who use them. But is not what I shared with you something irresistible in its power? That you don't even need those words to make the case? Do you know what happened here? <laughs> And that this place, too, is holy. And the Christianity transcends some of these divisions. Christianity always goes beyond. I think of Mark Chagall's white crucifixion at the Art Institute of Chicago. You've got the Nazis on the right and the communists on the left, and neither of them have the answer. And in the middle is the light of Christ. That's Christian politics. Transcending the talking heads and the Twitter fights with the truth of the area. You see what I mean, right? I used to glamorize the early Christian and Renaissance era, and then I realized I live in it. I could go be a part of the dig. I could meet the living ancestors of the people who received the gospel and were then ejected. I could be a part of that conversation. I remember as a person with no indigenous ancestry, panicking and thinking, am I appropriating about talking about this? I have no Cherokee ancestry. What do I, why, why am I talking to you? And I walked up to a Potawatomi Native American named John Lau, and I said, I think I need to stop my project. And he said, don't be silly. He said, we're 1.5% of the population. We need all the help we can get. You tell the story because it's part of the story of your ancestors, but you do it in conversation with us. And so it belongs to all of us, this tale. The goal, I hope you feel more thrilled to be here, maybe to make some of those trips yourself, save the money on the airfare, find out what's around here. If eventually you have kids, take your kids there, and if you haven't been there yet, go now. Tomorrow's Fat Tuesday, where we begin a season of Lent. And I know it's sometimes a downer, but let's listen to Chief Lewis Downing. He had a fast day proclamation in 1870 when he saw what was happening to his nation. To the Lord our God, let us go with our case. Let us pour out our prayers into the ear of the merciful Jehovah, who in the days of old hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. To him let us confess our sins. He's citing the Magnificat of the Virgin Mary. We'll talk about that a little bit more tonight. Why do I end with this? These aren't Cherokee ghost stories. They're alive. They're with us. And you can be in conversation with them. Thank you so much. Look forward to maybe talking with some of you afterwards. Thanks a lot. <laughs>